Hi everyone, is this loaded? Yes, hi. I'm Pia Mancini, I'm co-founder and CEO at Open Collective. And I'm thrilled to be here and I'm going to be talking today about building bridges between the legacy and the decentralized ecosystems to fund public goods for the future. So here we go. We're not going anywhere. Yes. So the TLDR, if we want to make philanthropy tech for people who are already the winners, then we continue like this. But if we want to lift people out of poverty and co-design, co-create this technology with them, then we must bridge the legacy system and help people over. Okay, that's what I'm going to try to argue now. So let's start with the thought framework that I use for thinking about where we are in the world right now. And my kind of TLDR of the thought framework is what, you, what used to be um, is no longer fit for our needs, but what will be is not here yet. So the current system is declining. We're seeing um, a paradigm that is um, it's on the way out. And we can see maybe far in the future the paradigm that we want to build, but we're not there yet. So where we are? Um, this theory is called, this framework is called the Three Horizons Framework, and it's super useful for me to figure out the type of technology that we want to build, the type of questions that we should be asking ourselves, and kind of try to make sense of what's happening in the world today. Where, where, where are we? So this Three Horizons Framework that was developed by the International Futures Forum is now being applied by Daniel Christian Wall to the transition towards regenerative culture. So let's think about this, right? The first horizon is the world in crisis, is um, what's, what's on the way out. It's the system that is no longer fit for the type of society, the type of technology, the type of education that we have today. So this is in decline. And at the same time, far, far away, we have this third horizon that is the viable world. And we are bam, stuck in the middle where all the messiness is. It's called the second horizon. And it's a world in turbulent transition. It's not clear what's happening. New technologies are opening new, up new opportunities. But maybe if we are lucky, we can identify the signals of the future. But the future is not here yet. At, at least it's not here for everyone, right? So what happens with innovation in each of these horizons? The first horizon, the type of innovation that we, want, that we can do is sustaining technology, essentially building stuff to maintain the status quo, um, business as usual, right? Let's keep the lights on, things like that. The second horizon, or the type of innovation that we see in the second horizon where we are today is called disruptive innovation. This means that we are seeing opportunities, we're seeing kind of shift happening, we're taking uh, advantage of those changes, and we're building, um, we're building technology that is kind of redefining the scope of what's possible. The issue that we have here, and it's what I'm trying to argue today, is that the type of disruptive technology, unless we're very careful in how we build it and with whom, we build it, we're going to end up sustaining the life of the previous horizon, of the, of the existing paradigm. Because if we, we, the risk that we face is to build technology that is just for the winners of the previous paradigm, those who are already winning, right? But when we go to the um, viable world, the world we want to build, the type of innovation that we can see is transformative innovation. It's innovation that is really building a new paradigm. And that means redistributing power. That means changing who's, who are the winners and who are marginalized, who are the losers um, in, the, in the political economy. Right? So what I want to argue here is that Web3 and this space needs to start thinking about the type of technology that we, we are building oriented towards this viable um, world. It needs to be informed by a long-term perspective. So we don't fall in the trap 
of building innovation that looks great, but is sustaining what we have today. Okay, so, you know, just to land it with a meme, old ways, the future we want, and how do we build that bridge, right? Because when a paradigm declines and another one is arising, it's not a clear cut. It's not like, oh, this is going to disappear and then something else is going to emerge. It doesn't happen like that. We need to build bridges. We need to build, bring people over. Okay, so in my mind, Open Collective is or can be one of those bridges. So we've been sustaining decentralized communities since 2016, and we've been doing it off-chain before DAOs were a thing. What are we? At the core, we are um, legal, admin, and financial infrastructure for decentralized communities to unlock access to money. We give a platform to organize and fundraise, and a global network of legal entities that act as custodians of the funds. I'll go into this a little bit deeper, but those legal entities are connected to the legacy system. So that is the bridge that we're building. So we created this open source, um, transparent finances platform, and we have a network of 245 nonprofits around the world that help uh, communities have access to money that otherwise they wouldn't be able to access. So the tech platform gives them fundraising tooling, it's open source, transparent payments, um, it's, you know, it's an international community, but like really the secret sauce is in this combination of the platform plus this network of fiscal hosts. The fiscal hosts give things, provide things to these communities that these individuals need. And what I'm arguing here is that if we want to bring those who today are marginalized by the current system over to the new system, we need to give them what they need today to survive and sustain themselves. And this is, is boring, right? It's like, trust me, I, I do this every day. It's like not fun, right? Proof of income, employment and benefits, reporting, compliance, tax deductible receipts, right? You want to make a donation to a collective, we're giving you a tax deductible receipts. Right? We are, you need employment. You have a collective that have, has funding. We employ you. Okay, so how you know, did we start? It all started with this need that we saw in the world back when we started Open Collective in 2015 to fund open source projects. Open source projects are the building blocks of the um, economy today. There is no company out there that is not using open source projects. But funding open source is very, very difficult. I really like this quote that I read recently. The original ethos of the web is a desire not only to idly exist within the world, but also to take part in its collective creation, right? And I think that there's few things that have embodied this idea um, as the open source ecosystem. So we want more open source, but we need to fund open source because unless we fund it, Guess what? The only ones who are going to be able to contribute to open source are those who have free time, who are able to have the time to spend in open source, who are privileged enough to be able to participate in open source without being compensated. Okay, so why is it so freaking hard to fund the open source ecosystem? Because of the attributes of open source. It's a non-excludable public, public good. It means that it's not scarce. And there is no marginal cost for another person to use the cost, right? There is no cost for a user to use open source. So it's very difficult to create scarcity here. And so, but open source is not free, right? It's not free as in a freebie here. Someone else paid for it. And the persons paying for it are the maintainers that are spending time building these technologies that we are all using. Um, and for us, we were seeing this huge community imbalance at the core of the open source ecosystem, and we wanted to step there and make a difference. So posting an issue has zero cost, right? You have a company, a startup, you're using open source, something is not working for you, you go on GitHub on a freaking rant and start asking the maintainers of that dependency to fix it for you. And you have no cost. What? Like you spend five minutes posting a toxic issue on GitHub. Fun. Companies are hooked on open source. Everyone is using open source because it doesn't have a cost. More people are extracting value from an open source project than those who are maintaining it. Right? So those who are 
um, creating um, open source technology are not extracting the value of what they're creating. Shared code, but not shared responsibility. And it's easy to start a project, but it's very difficult to leave it. Right? Once you start a project, you have six million applications using your dependency. Well, you just have to maintain it. What are you going to do? Right? So this is how. Um, so we started thinking, OK, how can we move money from all of these companies to the hands of these decentralized communities that are not organized around anything? And the pain point that we see is that in the open source world, formal contracts and partnerships agreements do not happen like they do in the business world. Right? So Google wants to give money to um, the Chromium Frameworks ecosystem. And they're like, OK, can I get an invoice for my you know, donation? And the developers are like, we are just a group of people doing code. Right? We want to get paid, but we have no formal way of doing it. So that's where Open Collective stepped in. I really like this quote from Swift on security. I don't know if you follow them on Twitter, but like they're amazing. I'm convinced that many developers have no freaking idea how business actually works and what operations departments have to go through to make things happen. Enrolling a new vendor is more than difficult. It's demoralizing. It eats your soul. Make it easy, and you're a god. I don't know if we are gods, but we're definitely making this easier for them. So this is what we created. Open Collective is like this digital interface that connects decentralized communities to, to uh, existing legal entities that deal with the clunky and old operating systems that are states and tax departments and, you know, all that boring jazz. And yes, Open Collective and the, the nonprofits go through the vendors process. And I, I kid you not, it looks like this. Or worse, it's SAP, right? Anyway, 3,343 open source projects are um, hosted by us. We've um, given $30 million in project-directed funding. And this is project-directed funding. We're just keep putting money in the hands of these communities. But we are now funding with this model multiple public goods, commons, grassroots, grassroots communities, um, social and political movements. So we have... We moved from just open source, that was the beginning, and we've exploded to thousands of different communities in the impact, in the solidarity economy, the climate justice, global movements, civic participation. We have 15,000 communities now using open source, um, the open collective, and we've given, you know, we've transferred 65 million into the hands of these communities. And we're not asking for anything in return. Like, we're not opinionated about how communities spend their money. They know what to do. We're just moving money from the center to the fringes. And our approach to sustainability has to do with grassroots cultures of governance and tech. And I think this is, this is very important for me to kind of communicate. Um, we've learned a ton from how grassroots organizers are operating. And when I've seen so many talks today and the last couple of days about governance and DAOs and dramas and this and that. And I'm serious, like this is like happening, it's been happening for decades in the grassroots organizing movements. They have a lot of really good solutions and processes and ideas. And what I want to do here is connect these two worlds. So for the way I define sustainability, refers to the resilience and thriving of projects, communities, and individuals that surround them, right? It's everything. It's not just the community or the token holders that are maybe addresses, right? I'm talking about humans here, about individuals. Um, and communities have started compensating themselves, right? Obviously, they're raising money, but they're also spending money. So in the last 12 months, we paid $23 million, $23 million in payments to hundreds, thousands of um, community members around the world. They're getting, uh, they're submitting invoices, they're getting 1099s, which is the tax form in the United States. They're getting proof of income. They can prove to their landlord that they have a pay stub, right? We are helping them be a circle in a world that is made for triangles. Okay, so what can we bridge? Um, with the legacy system to make decentralized communities sustainable. So in my mind, Web3 is operating 
kind of a little bit isolated from the legacy world because a lot of these things are still missing. And I think that it's time to start making those connections. Tax deductibility for donors in over 30 countries. Right, that is something that we can provide and we can support, like all of the amazing um, decentralized philanthropy tech um, do. Invoices, pay stubs, insurance, benefits, employment. I mean, I get it. It's, like, it's not sexy, it's not high tech. But you know what? The people that we are supposed to be helping need these things today, right? The, the marginalized of the previous paradigm, they're very much embedded in the legacy system, right? So we need to provide the tooling, the, the support, the infrastructure they need to bring them over. Okay, what is the trade-off? Because there's always a trade-off, otherwise I'll be lying to you all, and I'm not. The trade-off is that there's a power dynamic that happens between the collectives, the communities on the platform, and the existing legal entities that give them like a bank account and all of these services. This is true. This doesn't happen in the, in the Web3 ecosystem. These type of power dynamics don't exist. I think it's a cost worth paying today as long as we're building enough, um, as long as we're building what we're building with the capacity to change as the conditions change in the future. So we want to build resilient tech as well. And we're here to offer a bridge from legacy system to the house, right? To co-create and co-design philanthropy tech with grassroots culture and low tech solutions. Again, folks, if we are not inviting those who are marginalized by the current system, those who are not the winners today to co-create and co-design technology with us, we are just building stuff that looks amazing, but it's only going to sustain um, the, 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 the existing paradigm. It's not going to be transformative um, innovation. So like a fiat bridge for DAOs. I don't know why my design team lets me do these things, but, you know, sorry. But you get the idea. And it's happening already, right? Ofo Climate is a really good example. Ofo Climate is a nonprofit on the Open Collective Network. It's a host, but it's also a DAO. So what they offer is a legal entity for DAOs and grassroots initiatives, which are also DAOs, but they're just off-chain, right? And so Ofo Climate is used to bridge grassroots citizens with old-school foundations, and it's used to bridge those same citizens with the Web3 ecosystem. It's about coordinating those bridges between the two paradigms. Another example is the work we did with my good friend Kevin Owoki a couple of years ago, or maybe it was last year, who knows, pandemic and all. Um, Fundo SS, we wanted to try quadratic funding in the Web2 open source um, ecosystem. So we did one um, example, we did one um, experiment, and I think we're going to keep doing this because like Web3 is this amazing tool for um, creating sandboxes of innovation, iterating on governance and doing some radical experimentation, some of which we can bring to the Web2 world. Um, another example is I was talking uh, very recently with a radical team and so maybe some of the Radical um, developers or the developers that are on Radical, when they need to get funding from an entity in the legacy world, we can create a fund for Radical in Open, open Collective. And so we can offer both things. You want to get paid in tokens, amazing. But you need employment, you need pay stubs, you need invoices, we got you, right? Now pay attention here, please. Democratizing is not about um, just opening access, right? It's about open access and shared um, and participatory governance. Right? It's about both things, right? Um, and so Open Collective Inc., the platform part of the equation, is a company in Delaware, of all places, sorry. Uh, we have investors and, you know, cap table, etc. So, but what, what we want to do, what we're creating is infrastructure for the commons. So what we want to do is to transfer ownership of Open Collective to the commons. So we're doing an E2C, but it's not a tokenized E2C, it's like an exit to community done with a trust. So we're building a, a perpetual purpose trust Ugh. that 
um, is going to purchase and own the shares of Open Collective in the name of the community. And then on top of that, we're going to build a governance structure with the community. Now, the governance piece might have a DAO eventually because we are very global and it's quite difficult to do um, um, to organize this governance when you are like in one country. But it's not clear to us yet how we're going to organize this. But this is, this is our approach. What we learned through all of these years of managing, helping, working with decentralized technologies is that the challenges that we have, they did not change with technology. They are the same, right? Participation is hard. And today I saw this incredible talk earlier today by Tundler, I didn't catch his last name, but he was talking about why DAO, the DAO experience suck. And most of it has to do with participation wanes over time, right? First you have this burst of participation, but then it's very difficult to keep folks engaged. And that is not, it's not that it only happens, it happens everywhere, right? So the challenges that we all face are human, they're cultural, they're not technological. So please pay attention again, this is the last time. Democratic culture is upstream of democratic institutions. Folks, if you don't figure out your democratic culture first, you are not going to have good governance in your DAO. Right? It's just not going to happen. And so for Open Collectives E2C, for example, the exit part is the last step in the process. Right? First, we are starting this learning in public, we're engaging with the community, we're bringing them into the design of the thing, of the structure of whatever is going to be built, but we are co-creating, doing it, co-designing it with them. Because we don't want to be like a referendum, right? What happens with a referendum? Politicians can't, you know, figure it out, they throw the decision over to the people, they call it democracy, and then they, they boil it down to a narrow binary, should we stay or should we go? Right? We don't want to get to the you know, to the e exit moment and then tell our community, go govern the thing. You know, that's not how it works. We need to, you know, to learn with people how to participate, how to engage. Um, okay, we need to, something, we need to build these kind of nar radical narratives together about what we're doing, what we're doing, but we need to do it with those who are not the winners of the current system. I'm sorry, like I know I sound like a broken record, but unless we do that, like, why are we here, you know, to do disruptive innovation? Sure, but that's not going to bring us the world that we want to see. So do not sleep on culture. If culture and humanity get away from you, then there's no consensus mechanism that is going to save your community. Specifically, do not forget of some humans, those who can more easily see the pitfalls in the technology that we're building, right? So those who are not the winners in the current paradigm are the ones who can see and spot the biases more easily, right? Because they have no vested interest in maintaining the current narrative. And so, please, have a, have a conversation, have an honest conversation about what the negative externalities are of what you are building today and how you are going to absorb, internalize those externalities. What are your biases, right? Who's, who are you talking to that is able to poke holes on your narrative? The people closest to the pain must be the people closest to the solution. The last thing I want to see is a bunch of broken DAOs or DAOs with no communities in the, base case, you know, in the best case or just that we continue building a bunch of profitable opportunities for the winners of the current system that have all the interest and all the incentive to keep the political economy and systems in place that made them winners in the first place, right? Okay, I think I've repeated myself enough. So what are we doing here? What do we do at Open Collective? And I think that these are good learning experiences for everyone who's building DAOs or who's building projects in this space. What are we doing it to foster democratic culture? Remember, democratic culture is upstream of democratic institutions, right? So artists organize our fellows. We have a fellowship for, for artists who are helping us build build these radical narratives, we are learning in public, we have the solidarity school, P2P learning, context setting. Context setting is key for everyone to be able to act, right? We need to have this. Co-design, co-creation, whistleblower policies. Do you have whistleblower policies in your project? Are you thinking of an ethical framework in your project? Do you have conflict resolution? Are you interested in learning conflict resolution? Anyway, please think about these things. 
Um, so to recap, democratic culture is upstream of democratic institutions. Sustainability is about communities and individuals. We are in a transition horizon, so it's messy, it's ugly, but we need to be informed by long-term perspective. We need to be balanced and provide opportunities to bridge the systems. Folks, we are at the same time, I know, caregivers in the previous paradigm and midwives of the new one, right? We need to be balanced. We can't just say, we're building here, we don't care about like the old paradigm because there are a lot of people in the old paradigm that we need to work with and bring people over, right? So uh, be balanced. Governance is hard, it's hard for everyone build more sandboxes. I mean, the Web3 has provided a wealth of interesting experimentation. To me, it's fascinating, and I want to kind of encourage more of that. But please, do it with those who are not on code today. Do not understand your tech. Um, and be radically honest about the negative externalities, right? That is it, my friends. Let's talk. I'm all of that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pia, for, uh, for all your work and your amazing presentation. Thank so, yeah, you. let's keep building and support public goods. Yeah. And I think there's time for one question. Thank you so much, Pia. Uh, I'm Joyce. I'd love to know more about your thoughts on using incentives when building the democratic culture. A lot of DAO communities today would incentivize people for engagement and participation. Do you think that this is a healthy practice and or if this actually acting against the build up of that culture itself? Thank you. I think it's a, it's a really good question. I think it can work in certain um, frameworks, but the kind of pay to participate tends to have a very short life, right? Because once you get those initial tokens, then your incentives to participate are um, are low and so that they wane in time right and so you start being on like the, the outside of a project but you still have those tokens that wait and you can't really you know you're not really contributing but you are a, a part owner so i'm not a fan of that but i think in certain like smaller communities it can work well because it provides ownership and equity of those communities but when you start growing and scaling those communities that type of in incentives i think that it tends to ruin um, the community yeah perfect thank you so much thank yeah. you